wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we're coming to here with another great podcast. We certainly, as always, appreciate you tuning in. Uh, wonderful to have you folks here listening in to the Chris Voss Show on a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, just pick a day. Today's that day. Uh, and we have, of course, the most excellent guests. Uh, be sure to refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. We certainly appreciate when you do. Give it uh, five stars if you can on the old iTunes there. And also go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss to see the full video version of this interview. And you can see all the wonderful other guests we have on there as well. Uh, also, go to our new book club that we just launched about three days ago. It's on Patreon dot com for slash chris voss uh on there we're going to have uh, book giveaways and different things interactions talk about some of the guests that we had on uh, our experience with them talk about the books some of our impressions of them and uh yeah it's going to be a whole discussion about books and everything else and what we've been doing on the show kind of a background on the show if you will today we have a most excellent guest his name is tommy butler he has written a novel this is his first novel but he's written a lot before this is a, a novel called before before you go. Uh, Tommy was raised in Stamford, Connecticut, and has since called many places home, including New Hampshire, San Diego, Boston, New York City, and San Francisco. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School. He was a Peter Taylor Fellow at the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop and is an alumni of the uh, Screenwriters Colony. His uh, feature screenplay, Etopia, was the winner of Showtime's Tony Cox screenplay competition at the Nantucket Film Festival. How are you doing, Tommy? I'm doing well. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. Did I get that right? You're an alumnus or alumni? What's the difference there? Because I'm one person, I'm an alumnus. You're an alumnus. If I, There's <laughs> if, I, if I were two or more people, I think I'd be an alumnus. I, I saw that. And I was like, I don't know if I said that right, but alumnus, alumni. I, I skipped college. I was uh, too dumb for college, so they wouldn't let smart. me in. Too smart. One or the other, yeah. So, one of the two, but uh, I think we know which one it is. Uh, so, Tommy, welcome to the show. Give us some plugs so people can check you out on the interwebs. Uh, yeah, well, you can you can uh, find out more about the book or about me uh, on Goodreads or on Facebook, uh, or my website is uh, TommyButlerWriter.com. And that will lead you either to Goodreads or to Facebook. Um, but those would be the three main places on the web. Yeah. Awesome sauce. In fact, I just joined Goodreads a couple of weeks ago and I've been like, people have been liking the reviews. We got to do more of them, I guess. But uh, pretty cool there. So you've written this beautiful book that is uh, uh, kind of touching and enduring to me uh, so far called Before You Go. It looks like my green screen is going to mess it up a little bit. Um, uh, tell us an overview of this book, what it's about. Um, yeah, so this book, I guess it starts with kind of, I'll start it with kind of the theme or the questions that, that brought it, uh, got it going. And I'll, then I'll talk about where that, where the book came from that. Um, I think there were three kind of fundamental questions that got this book going or spurred this book on. One was, why does life sometimes feel so hard, even when it seems like it shouldn't? And two, is there anything we can do about it? And if not, then what? And I really um, thought about those questions long and hard, first as a human and then as a writer. And then as a writer, I started thinking kind of beyond the, the classic normal quick answers and started getting a little more creative about it, a little more open-minded about it. And uh, the ideas started to flow. And um, really what came first in this book are what I call the vignettes, which are shorter little vignettes, little stories that, that are interwoven through the main story. And these vignettes are a little more fanciful. They're about the afterlife and the before life or in the future. And they talk about um, kind of how we got here, why we are the way we are, um, uh, what may have gone wrong or may not have gone wrong, and what we can do about it. 
And so they're a little more um, abstract, a little more, um, again, fanciful. And then the main story is a story about Elliot Chance, who is a, a boy. We meet him as a boy in the 80s. And then we watch him grow up into his 20s. And we see most of his life um, as an adult. And Elliot is kind of, he's a particular instance of struggling with those abstract questions. Um, you know, why, why does life seem so hard? Like, what, why does it feel so hard? Why is he struggling? Um, what's wrong? And in his case, it's really about uh, kind, of, kind of the desire to connect both to be himself, but also to connect with others and, and the struggle there. And so we follow him into New York City where he gets a job and he's part of the dot-com boom and um, the people he meets and the characters he meets uh, also kind of struggling with similar questions in their lives and, and kind of this empty space that, 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 that rises up, which is not spoiling anything there. It's in the first, very first chapter. So this empty space in all of humans and, and kind of how they deal with it and, and, and what's making, what makes life worthwhile for them. Mm -hmm. And it, it really captured me at the beginning, as I mentioned the pre-show, uh, and the opening lines. I mean, would you mind if I read them? Oh, please. That's, I'm flattered. Yeah. And, on, and I'm not going to get too far in the book. I'm not going to read you the end. At the end. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do any jokes about it. Uh, but uh, in the beginning, I, you know, I, I don't read a lot of novels, so I want to make that clear. Um, because I don't know, I'm, I'm an unread inbred or something. I don't know. Uh, but what captured me was I opened up the book and I was like, okay, I'm going to, let's get a feel for what's in Tommy's novel. And, and the beginning was in a room that is not a room with walls that are not walls and a window that is not a window. Miriam considers her handiwork. The finished form lies on the table that is not a table illuminated by divine light that Miriam dialed to peak radiance so that she could tend to the last delicate touches. I won't go into the rest of it, but that captured, that captured me. I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can ask. That's, that's just what well, you want. really did. I it really did. I, my, my brain went, I got to find out what's going on here. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, Cause it, 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 it comes, it comes across like a, uh, Oh, what's it called? When, when something, a riddle, a bit of a riddle where you're like, in a room that is not a room and you're like what the hell is it? like i was sitting around going well, where the hell is this? it's not right. a room. <laughs> uh, i'm so glad to hear that really if, if i can get you kind of intrigued and then that's wonderful uh, hopefully yeah. hopefully it pays off for you as you go i think it will i i have enjoyed it so far um what and like i said uh, in the pre-show i've been i've been I, I like the character of elliot because it reminds me of a lot of what it was for like me growing up i don't know for a lot of young people nowadays but it will probably be romantic to for them to see what it was like to grow up in those days um you know pre you know when you're born at two years old they hand you a cell phone or ipad and <laughs> that's all you know and so you know i grew up in that area of uh, going into the yard and playing and and a lot of the stuff you talk about with elliot and his brother and his family and uh you know sitting around the dinner table and stuff like that but it's like you say it's interesting how you've placed these uh vignettes in between the story and both are incredibly insightful and um uh, and they're very beautiful. The, the way you write is very, um, I, I lack the uh, proper words, but it, it's just very descriptive, very beautiful. Um, you, you get a, you paint a beautiful picture where you get a good feel for, for what's happening. Um, and, and it just feels very detailed, if you will, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you so much. That That's really nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so how much of this, how much of Elliot is you in this book? Yeah, well, the short answer is none. Uh, Elliot's not me. It, okay. It, it's, it's not my story. But having said that, um, you know, to get a little more nuanced, I mean, certainly I, I grew up in Connecticut. Um, yeah. I've lived in Manhattan, and that's where Elliot, that's where Elliot's story takes place. For, and so, of course, I still, and I stole from my own experiences here and there to kind of give it texture, give it flavor. Um, and probably more importantly, more to the point, uh, on an emotional level, um, mm -hmm. I, Elliot is not me, but I certainly, I certainly have felt like a kindred spirit, not just to Elliot, but also to the other two main characters of Sasha and Banner. Um, you know, in Elliot in particular, I felt, you know, his sense of wonder, which you're, you know, you're already seeing in the very first chapters, and also his sense of disconnection, um, you know, his, his desire to be himself, but also belong. Um, I'm, I'm very tuned into those emotions. I didn't have to look very far to kind of um, hopefully bring those to the page. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true for Sasha and Banner. So it's, it's not at all, um, 
autobiography, but you know, emotionally, I, I get it. I, I'm in, I'm in their tribe, so to speak. <laughs> and and the before and after vignettes, uh, it was really interesting how you really approach them because they're kind of. Uh, they're kind of, you know, like there's so many different opinions uh, many people have, and there's whole governments and religions uh, built of them. And you've approached it in a way that is very, uh, uh, none of that is included in it. Like there's no, and, but you've painted it in such a beautiful uh, way and kind of an extraordinary way. I mean, you could almost, if you had a belief system to a certain either side, I'm atheist, but, but you could, you could certainly paint it. Well, this is, you know, whatever, but you, you took it from a, a really um, uh, kind of out of the box uh, sort of uh, build. Like, like that's, it just struck me really funny how you did it. And I was like, well, this is really a nice angle at looking at what this experience maybe it could be or whatever it is in coming to life and leaving life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was, it was very intentional not to, um, uh, not only to not promote, but not even to kind of talk about a particular, you know, religious view or anything like that. It was, it was, of course, there's a certain divinity to what's happening in those, in those vignettes, but I very much meant for it to be uh, more universal more global and, and just uh, more fundamental as opposed to picking a particular creed or view. Now, having said that, as you go, you'll, you'll see there's, there are certain angles here or there where we get into that a little bit more, but, um, uh, but the goal was to be a little more universal. And, uh, and in a way, in some cases, as you'll see kind of blending, blending different views. So, you know, I was raised in a, in a Christian culture, although I'm not necessarily, I don't really follow it at this point, but uh, that's how I was raised. I've also spent a lot of time reading about certain Eastern um, philosophies and they all kind of played into uh, those before and after vignettes to some extent. Yeah. And it's like, they can, they can be both kind of a random or, or, or not attached to anything. And I, I, I could see that if someone had um, a, the definition they had before, it, it was still play to them uh, and what they did. Uh, it was interesting. This is from the PR stuff. Uh, before you go, is not only a coming of age story, it is an exploration of the, our minds and the emptiness we share, but also often refuse to acknowledge. Butler speaks to the most vulnerable parts of us through Elliot and shows that most beautiful parts of life often are seen in the midst of the most challenging. Um, and it really strikes me. It's really interesting, especially some of the different things that happened to Elliot so far that I've been able to read in the book. Um, and uh, which part of the book did you have the hardest time writing about? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I'd say, uh, oh, let's see, which part of the book did I have the hardest time writing about? Um, well, you know, I guess from an artist standpoint, Act Two is always the most troublesome hmm. to some extent. I mean, the beginnings and the endings are uh kind of more interesting inherently and kind of more fun so the act two is always a is always a challenge to keep it going but i feel like i did and with my editor i did um but i think in some ways also the very first parts that you're reading now um because i think setting a stage for elliot and showing you who he is and where he comes from and and why that matters later in his life was very very important um so i had to kind of i wanted to get it right um and not, but also not belabor it. I don't want to spend too much time in his childhood because the most of the story is about him being an adult. Um, so I'd say those early Elliot chapters maybe were the toughest. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to some of the vignettes, which those also could be very difficult, but some of them just rolled. Some of them just came, which was, which was fun, a lot more fun um, <laughs> than, than kind of grinding it out. You know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, it's I, and like I said, I was I, in the pre-show. I was a little concerned that I'm like, well, maybe I just am predisposed to Elliot because you know I grew up in that sort of age. I grew up as a young boy. The scenes that you set, the interactions with his family and stuff, um, the playing in the yard, of course, as I mentioned earlier, and and so, uh, but but it's really beautifully set and everything, and and uh, so it'll be interesting as I pace through the book, um, if the. Um, as a writer, what would you choose to be your spirit animal? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, okay, let me, you got to give me a second there. As a writer, that's not as a human. This is as a writer. There you go. So my spirit animal? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Um, what's, what's a good delver? Like what, what digs deep? Maybe like mm. a bull? 
<laughs> Beaver, badger. Uh, yeah, badger. Maybe a badger. That's yeah. Something that I think something that digs that digs deeply. I think. Um, mm. I mean, I love I love light comedy as well. But some of the most profound stuff I've read, um, or the most kind of memorable stuff I've read, has been stuff that uh, that digs deep and that mm. kind of uh, kind of uh, isn't afraid to go there. And so I guess if I had a spirit animal, it would be something. It would be one of those that isn't afraid to delve. No. Yeah. You know, and digging deep, you can definitely see that in the reading because you you get into some interesting things with the before and after that not only are descriptive about it, but also give you give you uh, thoughts to your own experience. And you go, wait, and it's 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 kind of an interesting way of presenting it, where you you don't present it as like you should really think about this, but in the end, you 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 go, oh, I never really thought about it that way. But <laughs> you know, and uh, some of the third person out of body experience of the before of the after you 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 sit and you think that's really that would be an interesting ending yeah. and 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 some of the stuff you learn and it makes you reflect on your own life which is kind of cool um so uh what what else uh what, what are some of the highlights of the book that maybe you uh, can share with us that some okay. of the highlights? <laughs> yeah do you have any, uh, do you have well, any highlights or let's say favorite parts is there any favorite part that you yeah have? well i i guess um I can pick. I can pick a couple. I mean, not, I, maybe favorites. I suppose, or maybe ones I lean towards. But I guess one of the highlights is honestly what you just said. I, because um, it was very intentional to make the before and after vignettes in the uh, in the second person, told in the second person, meaning you, just you. Mm -hmm. uh, the main character in those vignettes is you, along with Miriam and Jalas. And for you to say what you just said, like that's a highlight to me, honestly, because the, the goal of those vignettes, in part, was to make it personal to all of us mm. without kind of trying to bang you over the head with telling you like how you should think or should feel. Yeah. Which I'm never going to do I, mean, I, I don't want to do that, but it was just proposing something or exploring something, but in the second person to kind of get myself, get the author out of the way, get the main character out of the way and just let you kind of play with it. And yeah. so um, that, that was, uh, that was one of the special parts of, of the writing of it for me. And to hear you say that is, is that is, is great. But, um, if that was your intent, you nailed it. <laughs> well, so far, so good, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There no, were I, some people too that I wanted to share this with that that uh, I wanted to share and, and be like, you should you should read some of this because uh, it might apply to you too. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. But uh, I, I think it makes you think a little bit about your life, and that's kind of what you get from this as you go through it. You start thinking about your life. And what have I done? And and where am I going? And what does it mean? And of course, this was the basis for what you uh, yeah. built on the book. Um, yeah, are you planning a sequel to the book? <laughs> I am not. I, I, well, once you're, I know you're not quite finished yet, but once you get there, you'll, you'll see that okay. uh, it probably doesn't lend itself to a sequel. So I, I am working hard on the next thing, which I'm not, you know, it's still early stages, but uh, it, won't, it won't be before you go to now. It's, uh, right. Can we make before and after into a science fiction film of Absolutely. space or something? Yeah, I don't let's know. make them into seven films. <laughs> <laughs> So there's another question I have for you. Uh, if this were made into a movie, who would play your characters? Uh, well, you know, we have a great film agent on it, um, Shell Crows, who hopefully is, he, she knows much more about that world than I do. So hopefully she's kind of masterminding those names. But, um, you know, I'm sure there, there are a number of good people. The only person that jumps to mind for Elliot because uh, again, I don't necessarily know. I'm not that up to speed on all the actress names these days, but the person who kind of jumps to mind for Elliot is uh, Tom Holland. Uh -huh. who, uh, I know he's played Spider-Man well, but I, I, he also has shown other, you know, I think he can do uh, much more human character as well, or normal human, I should say. Um, I'm going to pull up Tom Holland here to see. Oh, okay. Um, was he in the newest Spider-Man? Was that it? I think, well, he's been in the, some of the other, the Marvel stuff. Oh, the Avengers and stuff. Yeah. He's been so, in the Avengers. Yeah, he's a good-looking kid. I well, can see him as Elliot. Yeah, his, his character, his the way, even the way he plays that role, uh, I think he'd, he'd be a great fit. But uh, I'm sure there are many more. Sasha and Banner. I'm not sure. I mean, Banner, you know, certainly as many of us did. Morgan Freeman, although Morgan might be, uh, Banner's I think quite a bit younger at this point. I can't. I'm not sure. But you know, Morgan Freeman to me was like. He was one of my, one of those idols. Like just in Shawshank Redemption roles like that, he was just fantastic. yeah. Would um, he be good as the uh, guy in the before and after who's got the notepad? 
Oh, well, he has played, he has played a divinity in uh, one of those yeah. other kind of movies, but I don't think, he, I think he'd be better as Banner, but yeah, yeah why not? he could probably play that role too. I mean, he's so I mean, good. it's your book, you know. Yeah, and he, I mean, he's played God and yeah. I mean, like he's, he's always in this, but I don't know. He doesn't seem like how you've written the, the guy in the before and after. He doesn't seem very, uh, uh, Freemanish. I don't know. No, they're, they're a bit more bumbling, uh, as as you'll see, and I think I describe them later as bumbling. You know, Morgan in his roles always seem very in control and very poised, and mm-hmm. Mary and Wallace are definitely they're bumbling around a bit. They're <laughs> trying to figure things out. Is the bumbling uh, there as a way to keep it light, where there's not the push there of of an agenda or an idea or concept of of just trying to make it that just kind of a light fluffy feel where you don't really know where it's going, but th- then you're left with, you're left with, uh, well, I've got to figure this out and make up my own mind. Yeah. I, I, partly that's true. I mean, uh, I, I, as I started thinking about those questions, which are, you know, pretty heavy questions I told you about, I, one of the things that jumped into my mind immediately was that as a writer, I don't want to treat them in the way that I feel that they're often treated, which is just as very heavy topics. And so I thought, how how can we look at this seriously but lightly, you yeah. know? And, and can we do we sacrifice something by looking at it with a little more um, levity? And I thought uh, the answer was no. In fact, I think I hopefully got more out of it than I would have otherwise. And so, yeah, it's intentional. Miriam and Jalis are they are somewhat bumbling and hopefully very likable. Um, but but they're also you also take their their missions and their trials seriously um, and the questions they're facing seriously. Yeah. I'm going to be, I'm going to, it's going to be interesting to see what, as Elliot grows up, but it just captured me. Like I got to the before part and, and I got captured by the first of it. And then I got into Elliot and I really liked Elliot and his little family and stuff. And it reminded me of my own. So uh, like I said, I don't know how biased I am. And then, it, and then it went into the after and the, the other vignette there. And then you're like, okay, so what's going on now? And then, and then you see it and it does give you a lot of, um, uh, things that you think of introspectively, but you you deal with it in such a light way that you're you're left to deal with that on your own. You're you're just it makes you think on your own without telling you here's what you need to think about. Yeah, um, I have, that's definitely a goal. Yeah, I, yeah. Know. And then it goes back into Elliot, which I of course enjoy, um, and him growing up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a beautiful book and just fun to go through from what I've experienced so far. Um, the uh, uh, I, what was the funnest part of it for you to read or write? I'm sorry. Um, well, the most fun was some of the vignettes, as, you, as you'll see, uh, were very fun to write because some of them are, are definitely com- more comedic. Mm-hmm. Um, so those can be kind of fun to write. You get to correct a few jokes, hopefully make the reader smile a bit or laugh out loud here and there. Um, but then, the, so, so some of the vignettes, for sure. Um, there are a couple of, you haven't gotten to these yet, I don't think, but there are a couple of vignettes that are about, they're called In the Future. Uh, and these end up being what I call Banner's Tales, which is not spoiling anything, but uh, the character Banner is, the character Banner essentially has told Elliot that he has traveled to the future. Mm-hmm. And so he's telling Elliot what, how things are going in the future. And, and it, it plays into the theme of, of life, what life's about and so forth. And so some of those, you know, I, you had leeway to get very creative with those um, and be a little more fanciful. So those are fun. Um, and then the Elliot story, of course, is a more kind of hardcore realist, very real story. Um, but, you know, the, the most fun moments of that, I think, probably for any writer or, or, or when you, after you've worked really hard to set the moment up mm-hmm. and then you get to write that moment. And if it comes out, whether it's in the third draft or fourth draft or whatever, if it comes out the way you, if it lands the way you hope after mm-hmm. all that work and then you get to land that moment, that is, I mean, fun is a word. Yeah, it's it's not just fun. It's very re- rewarding. Um, yeah. So I can't, of course, tell you what those are yet. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it. Yeah, I read the the PR thing, and it says that he gets caught up in the future stories of Ben. And so, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, you you got great reviews of this thing. Alluring, magical, and painfully real will make your heart ache in all the right ways. A triumph for all of us who suspected there's something missing deep within Matthew Quick, the New York Times. Um, let's see, uh, the best-selling author of the Silver Linings Playbook. I suppose I should credit that properly. Um, hats off to the brave soul daring to write what might be called speculative, liter- speculative literary fiction. 
and willing to venture questions or venture answers to questions even beyond life and death. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting how you wrote, it, especially the beginning um, where, you know, the before and after, and then they, there's a, the vehicle that has a hole in it and it has to be filled. And as you go through the telling of the story, you know, you start to reflect on your own experience, like what we do in life to fill the hole that we have and, and, and everything else. And, and what made you, what made you think of that? Like what, what, what was there, was there a creative thing that you took that from? In yeah. yeah. Religion or That's, something like that. I, I, you know, there, there very well may have been, and, and honestly, you know, there's the joke is you know, nothing is original, right? Because I mean, it seems like everything, pretty much everything you write down has probably come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases in this book, I can point to very specific, kind of idea sources, um, whether it's a poem or something that I read or somebody I had a conversation with someone. But to be very honest, the initial chapter, and again, I'm not spoiling it by saying that, you know, the initial chapter, Mary and Jalos are creating humankind. Um, and for one reason or another, um, Miriam puts a little empty space uh, in, in the vessel, in the human body. And Jalos tries to fill it with every single emotion on the rack and fills it and fills it with all this emotion. And I, I don't think I... I just think that came out of just, you know, long, long periods of rumination. I can't remember a specific mm -hmm. kind of source for that, but it seemed to fit with the, the answers to those questions, which is, you know, why are we, why does life seem so hard? Well, maybe because we are basically just a bundle of emotions with a bit of an empty space. Like that would, that would explain a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. That's really we're emotional so. creatures And we've got this little empty space in us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, was there any inspiration that, that came to you from other books you may have read or written or, or, uh, or what well, you did writing before with different things? Yeah. Um, or yeah. is there any, is there any author that speaks to you the most? Maybe how about that question? I wouldn't say there's an author that speaks to me the most. I mean, certain books over time, uh, spoke to me quite a bit, but I don't, I don't necessarily follow one author or another. Um, I can't think of the, the specific influences on in this book other than, I mean, there are some random ones. Like there's a, there's a, one of the before vignettes uh, was very much kind of uh, inspired by a poem by Robert Frost called the trial by existence, which is, um, well, I don't want to say too much about it, but it's about kind of uh, the before life and how you end up getting into your life. Um, so that definitely came from there. Um, there are some ideas later in the book that certainly come from kind of, uh, kind of a westernized understanding of Zen or of Eastern philosophies um, and kind of this kind of the oneness after it all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I didn't, and I, and I guarantee there are many other influences that played into it, but I just haven't kept track of them and I haven't, I don't really know. Yeah. It's the, it's the interesting experience of being an artist or an author is you, you know, you just take, you just take the compilation of everything that you've gotten and, and it pours in and out. Yeah, I guess, really, really, that's true. That's me. It's, it's very true. Uh, what was your highlight of writing the book? What was for you the highlight? Um, the highlight. The highlight. Was there any aha moments where you you oh, learned so something many. from maybe oh, writing the book? Oh, so many. Yeah, there are so many. I mean, it was very. Um, I was delighted by how this grew on its own as I went. It, it just. Uh, the ideas started to come and I, some of them I can't kind of talk about, but even, um, well, for example, so, so for example, the, in the future vignettes, and there are just a few of those, uh, that, so, you know, the before and after is about, you know, before you were born, this happened, or after you die, this happens. The, in the future is about in the future, this is happening, you know, um, in the future, they've extinguished the will to live or in the future, um, there's a pill for everything. Um, and those vignettes were coming because they very much spoke to the theme I was trying to get at, but I wasn't sure how they fit in kind of plot wise, not that they necessarily had to, but it, it was, it would have been nice. And then a, one of the aha moments was, Oh, this is Banner. This is Banner thinks he's, thinks he's been in the future or has been in the future. And these are the stories he's telling Elliot. And so when that kind of happens, when it kind of starts to weave like that and it just feels, it feels amazing. And you just are thankful for it because I, you, know, you just spend a lot of time thinking and opening your mind and dwelling on this and you hope the ideas come. And um, yeah, they, they, quite a few came in that, in that way. And I felt grateful. 
Cool. Uh, I noticed there's there's uh, year dates in the book in the parts for Elliot. It, I, I'm assuming those are years. Like there's 1981, 1982. Was there a reason you chose those years for the setting in the book? Yeah, I think there is. <laughs> I think um, one was I. I guess I was trying to steal from my own experiences to some extent, and I did want to show Elliot in that kind of pre-screen world, that more kind of sense of that sense of wonder with nature and so forth. And so in order to steal from my own experiences, I chose a timeline that was fairly similar to my own timeline. Um, and then as you'll see, well, again, I can't talk about the end yet, but uh, th those, th that timeline just fit very well with how I wanted this Elliot story to unfold. Um, and we also, of course, are following him into his adult life. So he had to be born in the past anyway, because we're going to be with him now in at some point, you know, in more recent years, let's say. Okay. Um, and there was another reason I had for it, but I've forgotten how it was. Um, hmm. But that it was, was interesting. One of the main reasons, yeah. I've skipped ahead a little bit. I noticed there's a part one, part two, part three, I think. And stuff four. and then and then what's interesting is you you hop through the years and so uh it's not like a story like okay uh you know here he is at one and you go through one through five uh, is that correct one sorry one through we're we're you know like a you know how sometimes stories will start at at this point and the whole the whole book is about you know from from that point on to a right. point you, you seem yeah. to bring us back in after coming through the vignettes to uh, different different times in his in his life. Yeah, yeah, we do. So we start with him when he's nine and ten years old, mm -hmm. and that's that's part one. And then we jump to his early twenties, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when we spend the vast bulk of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say if and how he gets older, or whether he, you know what happens then, but yeah, certainly some big time jumping because I wanted to cover basically his life. Uh, and that was one of the big challenges. I had to kind of work on that and learn and, and uh, you know, covering an entire, the character's entire life in a less than 300 page novel was, was uh, challenging, but it really made sense for the story I was trying to tell. Um, yeah. It brings you back in too. Cause you're like, wait, it's been a while since I, you know, cause you're flipping between the vignettes of the before and after and you're like, Okay, so what's going on now? I guess find yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, you get thrown out of the story. But I think, I think you, I think it works. It brings you back in. Like yeah. it brings you back in, and you're like, I got to read this next. Chapter. Like that's what happened when when you uh, came on. I was, I, I had gotten to the end of a chapter, and I, then I was like, oh, I got to find out what the hell. Oh, I, <laughs> I interrupted you. <laughs> that's, that's the biggest sin. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, you're no, you're fine. I usually like to kind of sit down with a book and have it before me and kind of be either perusing it or going through my notes or something as I'm talking to the author, because, because I can have it right here. Uh, but I can have stuff that reminds me, you know, I'll flip through it as we're, as I'll usually be interviewing an author. Um, how long did it take you to write the book? So um, a lot of the ideas and uh, kind of a lot of the ideas were percolating for quite some time, but from the day I kind of first started really outlining and structuring and taking notes. I did that for a year on the calendar, the calendar year. Um, and then I, only then did I start to write after I had very heavily outlined and very heavily thought about uh, so many things, characters and everything else. And then I started to write. And then on the calendar, it was two more years of writing. Wow. Um, and then we had about six months or so of editing with my editor. Do you think you took the approach that you did in the book and, and, and gave it that kind of openness because you, you had that time to write and you had, kind of had that space to kind of form it. Like you didn't have a gun to your head where you're like, I got to do my author contract in six months or something. Oh God. Yeah. I can't even, I, I mean for this kind of book or for what I hope to write next, I can't imagine writing under a gun. It would be, uh, yeah, I, I, I would just fail. I would just fail. Yeah. I, I need a lot of space. I, um, I need a lot of space to, to create. Um, yeah. It's a very inefficient process in that way. You know, it's, it takes a lot of just what look like empty hours, but aren't because your brain is working uh, and your, your mind is working, but it's, it's a lot of time. 
again. Yeah, and you can see that in the book. It's it's got a real feel to it. That's light, fresh, uh, beautiful, uh, very well detailed. And like I say, it really captured me. I, I got sucked into it because I'm like, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, and it's, it's just kind of a page turner um, where you're you're just like, I got to find out what happens next. And you get the vignettes, and you're like, oh, okay, what's this part about? Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> and then you get and then you get the chapters again. You go, okay, now I got to find out what's going on here. And it, it just keeps you turning the pages which i think is really interesting um so do you plan to make more novels in the future or are you thinking about doing some other different things yeah what i'm working on now is a novel for sure um mm -hmm. i've also written screenplays and i, I don't want to uh, let that go i mean i definitely still enjoy that form as well mm -hmm. but what I'm working, my next big project that i'm kind of deep into now and uh on that long road is a novel so mm -hmm. that's that's well, hopefully what's next it does uh fortunately or unfortunately take you know, a long time, but, uh, but I'm excited about where it's at now. So I, I definitely see that going forward. Kind of like a fine wine. Everything takes time. So yeah. anything I haven't asked you about the book that we should maybe know there, that would be important for readers to get them motivated and want to pick it up. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess this is my great, my golden opportunity to sell my own book, but I'm such a bad salesman that I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, uh, I hope, I hope what, people find in it is it's uh, you know, when my editor first uh, wanted it, she first read it and she, she fell for it and she wanted to work with me on it. And she, she, she said it was uh, it kind of straddled both worlds of the literary and the commercial. And that was music to my ears. Cause I really felt that that's what I was kind of trying to achieve and felt like I had, and she mm -hmm. agreed. And so I think for readers, I, I hope that that's, it's very much in both those worlds. And so, um, it's kind of a broad pitch, I suppose, but I, but it's very genuine. I, I think it's, I hope that the writing is, as you say, you know, the kind of writing that literary readers love to read, um, just the terms of phrase and sentences, things like that, but also that it is, that it is a, a page turner. And so commercial, that it's more of a commercial piece of fiction where you are kind of very invested in the, in the characters and you're flipping pages because you want to find out what happens next. And so I really hope it's both of those things. I, I, I personally feel it is, and I just hope, <laughs> hope readers agree. You know? I think it is too. Like I said, I'm not a big novel reader and it really, it really took me from the beginning and I just kept turning pages and kept going, I got to find out what's going on next. And then, you know, maybe, maybe I have a multitask sort of issue. I, I hopefully mo most people's brains are like me, but the difference of the stories, like sometimes when I, when I listen to a story or when I watch a movie, um, you know, it, it becomes, it plays out from the beginning to the end and there's no real, there might be a subplot in there or something like that, but, but there's, there's, uh, you know, there's just a beginning and end. Sometimes I can see the end coming because of the way it's, it's set out. I, I hate that if I'm watching a movie where, where I go, I know where this goes. I mean, I know what happens, you know, unless it's a movie that has like an, uh, I don't know what the correct word is, but antithesis ending like seven or so, you know, something, yeah, yeah, something yeah. where the bad guy doesn't win, like no country for our old men. Yeah. Um, but that's the, that's the, that's technically the, the story. Life isn't always fair. Um, but uh, it kind of has a, uh, what's the movie? Quentin Tarantino. It's not really Quentin Tarantino, right. but you know, Quentin Tarantino does those pieces. And of course yeah. yours seem to be in a semblance of order. I I'm guessing, cause I haven't finished the book, but, but, you know, the, the cutaways, the vignettes, like you say, um, they keep you more captured to the story because you're trying to keep up and and then you're playing kind of, a, I guess, a cat and mouse in your head where you're like, what's going on next? <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. And I, I, that's that's a great, um, I mean, I'm very glad to hear that. I think I think the book does, you know, you, I do hope that readers uh, pay attention. You know, you want to pay attention to it. I, it's, it's not necessarily a really breezy beat read. It's, it's more of a book that you want to, kind of sink into. And I think that the Elliot story is such that the vignettes were, I mean, I think they're necessary for so many reasons, but one of them was, was to kind of give you a breath from that story and get you to the vignette story, then give you a breath from that. And so hopefully the, it's the right rhythm to keep you moving forward. I think it was, if the vignettes were all gone, you would, it would be a very different read. So hopefully it's doing just what you described. Yeah. Yeah, so far it is. And I definitely like it. Be sure to check it out, everyone. It's the book Before You Go by uh, Tommy Butler. It's a novel. Uh, and uh, I've been enjoying it quite uh, quite a bit here as we've uh, talked about. It. It's got uh, reviews and everything else. Uh, Tommy, as we go out, uh, give us your plugs so people can know where to pick this baby up off the interwebs and get to know you better. 
Yeah, well, you can, I, at this point, I think you can buy it really almost anywhere. So independent bookstore near you, hopefully will have it or can get it very quickly. Um, certainly Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the big, you know, the, the big stores. Books, Inc. is my local regional bookstores that uh, hosted my launch event. And uh, as far as the book itself, you can find it on Goodreads or Amazon or you can find me on Facebook or at TommyButlerWriter.com. Awesome sauce. Awesome sauce. Well, we'll look forward to your future works and uh, everyone go get a chance to pick this up. I really liked it so far and I'm just, I'm still at the beginning, but I'm just captivated. By it. And uh, the, the story, the way you laid it down, the way it's, it's not, it's not really forcing the story on you. And it's really beautifully written. Like the, the, the stories, especially about Elliot and what he's going through, like it just brought all of my childhood back to me. Uh, the chasing through the yard. Um, I don't think we ever caught leaves, but we would catch, uh, when we went to West Virginia at my uncle's place, we would catch uh, the jars of, uh, oh, the, of light uh, bugs, the, the lightning bugs. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, then you'd hold them up at night. And, yeah, and, uh, that could have that, easily been in the book. It wasn't, but it could have easily been. That there. brought me back to it, though, the oh, catching yeah. of the leaves, that, that whole experience and being in the yard. I don't know if we ever chased leaves, but, you know, that whole experience that that fortunately uh, uh I, I grew up with you know where you know we had one of those moms that was and and i'm not saying she was a bad mom but they don't make those moms anymore we had one of those moms is like you get out of the house and you don't come back till dinner <laughs> right, right. and so we go adventuring and so everything outside was an adventure you know oh, magical nowadays the nowadays the parents are like you get in here you know the all the crap that goes on in the world might get you if you don't if you don't stay in the house. Oh, yeah, so that. yeah, my mom was my mom was like, I don't want to uh, hear or see you. I don't want you in the house. You know, she chased out of the house with the broom. And yeah. you guys go, but the adventures that we used to go on, the things that we used to learn and experience, uh, um, I would never regret for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, but thanks for coming on the show, Tommy, sharing the book. It's a beautiful book. Everyone go check it out. Uh, you can go also to the cvpn.com and subscribe to online podcasts there. You can go see the video version of this at youtube.com for just Chris Voss and also check out the uh, book club that we're building over at patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. That's patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. We'll talk about the books more in depth, give away some books, uh, talk about some other things. We've got some plans to do some interesting things with authors in the future if it grows to what we want it to. So subscribe to the club over there. Thanks to my for tuning in and we'll see you next time.